Listen with your heart this morning. sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed Through many dangers, tolls, and snares I have safe thus far and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shine help I want to begin a series of messages this morning in the out of the book of Genesis around Noah and the flood this ought to be a a passage of scripture that God's people would be very interested in studying and learning about for no other reason than to know that Jesus said that uh, the times just before his return would be just like the times in Noah's day. If you've got the Bible, go with me to Matthew 24 first. I want to read those two verses and then we'll go back to Genesis chapter 6. Matthew 24 verses 37 and 38. Jesus said, but as the... Well, let me back up to verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man... Know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I don't know the hour, I don't know the day that Jesus is coming, and neither 
does any other human being. In fact, he goes a, a little further here and he says, not even the angels in heaven know when Jesus is coming again. If you knew Jesus was coming today, would it make a difference in what you do in this service? If you knew he was coming at three o'clock this afternoon, would it make a difference in how you approached your worship here this morning? Think about it. But I don't know that for a fact. But what I can know, look at verse 37. But, even though I don't know the day or the hour, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the, day, for as in the days that, they were, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Well, if that be a fact, then we ought to be very interested in what kind of days those were. Look back now in your Bible to Genesis chapter number 6, and we'll read these first six verses. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Let me stop right there and remind you of something. When the Bible was written, there were no chapter divisions. So in reality, what we've just read would have been right after what happened in verse 32. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in of the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Would you pray with me? Father, uh, I know I need your help this morning. Better than anyone else in this room, I know this morning. Please help me. Bring to my mind those things that I've studied and give me clarity of thought. Lord, that I, I would be able to present the truth of your word as you would have it presented this morning. I pray if in this room today there's one who has spiritual need, somebody who's not saved, somebody that, that needs to trust Christ, would you help them to understand the seriousness and the lateness of the hour that we're living in? And then, Lord, help that Christian this morning who may be living afar off from you to realize, Lord, where we are, where we are on God's calendar, where we are on that time when Jesus is coming again. And as a child of God, we'll give an account for our lives. Lord, I pray you deal with our hearts this morning. Encourage the hearts of your people. Speak to us this morning, and we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. I want us to take a few moments this morning and look at the days before the flood. Genesis chapter 6 through 9 are the great flood chapters in the book of Genesis. They describe to us the world leading up to the flood, chapter 6. They describe for us the flood itself, chapters 7 and 8. And then they describe for us the events that immediately take place after the flood in chapter 9. The verses that we've read here in chapter 6 this morning document the moral degeneracy, the depravity of society before the flood, and then God's determination to bring judgment upon man's wickedness. 
one of the fellows that I like to read after, like to study after, he's with the Lord now, uh, Dr. Henry Morris. He was the founder of Creation Research Society and the Institute for Creation Research. And uh, thank the Lord for uh, an individual who devoted his life to research in that area and has given us so much help as far as uh, Christian people and understanding creation and understanding the things that took place in the, uh, in the early parts of God's Word. Dr. Morris said that moral and spiritual conditions in the world of that day, in Noah's day, had deteriorated with the passing years. Not only among the Can Canaanites, the descendants of Cain, but eventually among the Sethites, the, the, the descendants of Seth as well. Materialism and ungodliness abounded, except for a small remnant connected with the line of the promised seed, along with those few who have been influenced by the witness of such men as Enoch that we read about in, in Genesis chapter 5. The prominent character of these chapters is this man by the name of Noah. But Noah is not only a prominent character here. Noah is prominent throughout the Word of God. You, you'll find this man, Noah's name, mentioned many, many times. In fact, at least 58 times we find Noah mentioned in the Word, word of God. Only two men lived longer than Noah did. Methuselah lived 969 years, and his great-great-grandfather, Jared, lived 962 years. Noah lived 950 years. The Bible here gives us a, a very detailed description of the days that lead up to the flood, and God speaking to Noah about the building of the ark and all that's going to take place there. And as I said, as we started and looked at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, we're told that we ought to examine these days very carefully because they reveal to us the season, what the season of time is going to be like before the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. This morning, I, I want to take just a few moments and Look at three truths that are revealed to us here concerning the world of Noah's day. And let's draw a parallel between that world then and the world that we live in this morning. Look with me first of all at the wickedness of Noah's day. When you look at these verses, really you can summarize the evil of Noah's day under three headings. And, and, and I want to give those to you this morning. First of all, they were days that were characterized by wicked marriages. You read that in verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all, uh, all which they chose. I, I see three things here as I... As I look at the, the, the days here that are characterized by wicked marriages. First of all, we see their setting. Verse 1 gives us the setting here. These were days when the population was increasing dramatically. I, I mean, we read this and we're right here in the beginning of the Word of God. And, and if we aren't very careful, we'll just assume that there were few people alive on planet earth during this time. But here's what you need to think about. If you consider that the people of this day begat sons and daughters even into their latter years, and we talked about Methuselah, 969 years, and, and Jared, 962 years, and Noah, 950 years, and, and that's, uh, uh, those are the oldest, but the, uh, the, the other people live to be, uh, to be very old in, 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 our, in our judgment, but they, they still bore children even into their latter years, and you, you begin to get a sense for the size of the population before the flood. Again, I, I, I owe 
my thought and my study here uh, to Henry Morris and, and what he said in, in uh, writing about this period of time. He, he said that uh, estimates are that the population would w have been well over a billion people on planet earth as we begin reading Genesis chapter 6. Now there's not anything wrong with having children. Don't, don't misunderstand where I'm going with this. That's God's will. God created Adam and Eve uh, to multiply and replenish the earth. But here's the difficulty. When, when you have the multiplication of people who are living apart from God, then what you have along with that is a multiplying of depravity and of sin. That's always the case. You, you, all you've got to do is look at the large cities in our nation today. When, when, I mean, you don't, you don't listen to the news a single day, but what horrible things are going on in large cities like Atlanta and large cities like Washington and large cities like New York and large cities like Los Angeles, California. Population centers of the world. Well, what you have in that is a, is a, a, a focus of, of depraved people living in one place and the wickedness is magnified as a result of that. That's always been the case. And not, not only do we see the setting of these marriages, but we also, as I look at it, see the spirits behind these marriages. It's evident, as you get on down to verse number 5, that there was an explosion of demonic activity in Noah's world before the flood. Now stay with me for just a minute because I, I, I'm going to tread out on some ice this morning and, and it's not thin ice for me because I know where I stand. It may be thin ice for you. There are differing views and I, I was amazed as I read and studied for the message. There are differing views among good men of, of God about who these sons of God were. I mean, it's amazing how, how, many, how, how many people fall down on one side or the other of this thing. Some believe that they're a part of a group of fallen angels who had taken the form of man and they were cohabiting with the godless women of that day. Now, I, I, I have a problem with that. I've always had a problem with that. I, I had a problem with it the first time I, I, saw, I heard somebody talking about it like that and as I begin to read about it. I believe it is speaking of the marriage of the godly Canaanites that you read about in chapter 5 and the, and the, and the godly line of Seth that's also talked about in chapter 5. And I believe it is nothing more than, than a part of Satan's strategy that he began coming out of the Garden of Eden to corrupt the bloodline of the promised Messiah, doing everything he can in his power to somehow corrupt that bloodline that, that's needed for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, to come. Now, here's one of the reasons I've always had some difficulty with angels marrying, uh, fallen angels marrying human women. Jesus talked about the angels in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30. And if you'll read that, Matthew 22 and verse 30, you'll see that our Lord suggests there that angels cannot enter into sexual relations. They don't have children. They were created by God. They, they don't have children. I do not believe that fallen angels literally married women and produced offspring. If that had been the case, then, then, then God would have brought judgment upon them just like he brought on the human race here in, in Genesis chapter 6. But we don't find any judgment on the, on the angels here. We find judgment uh, upon the wicked men of that day. Along with that, this, this theory that these were angels cohabiting with women would give a, a lot of good material for fiction to be written. Greek mythology. If you know anything about Greek mythology, I mean, that, that's where we're getting all these superhero stuff today. 
that our kids are being consumed with. And it's always been a it's always been a fantasy world for people to come to. Some kind listen, there isn't but one superhero that ever came into this world, and that was his name was Jesus Christ, the, the Lord of heaven. And he came to the womb of Mary, not because she had sex with an angel, but the Holy Ghost implanted that seed. Now I gotta back up. My wife's gonna get on me. I can already feel it. She's already frowning. You're not supposed to get excited and raise your voice. But I can't help but get excited when I talk about my Lord and his coming into this world. All of that would make good fiction. He would make good Greek mythology. But I want to tell you, friend, you're going to have some real difficulty on down the way. As you, I mean, you're going to have some real theological problems if you start having angels cohabit with women. When did it start? When did it stop? What, what, what stopped it? And, and all that sort of thing. I still believe that all of this that we're reading about here is nothing more than a satanic uh, attempt to thwart the, the promised seed of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I believe that it was something very much like the increase uh, of demonic possession described in the New Testament uh, as Jesus came the first time. Uh, we, we see an increase of it and, and our Lord dealing with it during his physical ministry. But I also believe that the Bible tells us that there will be an increase of this demonic activity as we near the second coming of Christ. Go over to 1 Timothy. We don't have time to go there this morning. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 and read about it. Read about it in Revelation chapter 9 and verse number 20. So we, we see the, the, the setting of these marriages. We see the spirit behind these marriages. But we also see the sensuality uh, of these marriages. Look at the latter part of verse number two. Well, let's just read all the verse again. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took wives, to, they took them wives of all which they chose. Do you see what's going on here? On the human side, these marriages were based on sensual, physical appeal rather than godliness and spirituality. The word fair there means beautiful. They were like so many young men and young women in this world today when they start looking for a companion to spend their life with if they don't meet their criteria as far as beauty is concerned or handsomeness is concerned, that then they're not interested in them. The, the outward looks become the primary criteria for a marriage partner in Noah's day. But where are we today? Listen, whenever a society is in spiritual and moral decline, that's always going to be a characteristic of that society. They're, 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 they're looking for the physical rather than the spiritual. Need I say this morning that our days become just like Noah's day where this thing of, of, of outward beauty, outward handsomeness is being used to literally to, to pour gas on moral corruption at an alarming rate in our culture. Look at the Hollywood movie industry and all that's involved there. Look at our advertising industry. Look at the pornography industry today. Sadly, sadly, the majority of marriages and relationships today are based on lust and that alone, passion rather than purity and truth. Now that's not to say that there's anything wrong with physical beauty. God, and, and listen, <laughs> it, it, takes, it takes more than, than, than uh, a good figure and uh, uh, a half a truckload of Mary Kay to make somebody pretty. Hello? It takes a lot more than that. I believe we ought to make the best of how God has made us. I, I, don't, believe there's any, I, don't, I don't believe there's any excuse for a man being a slouch. Hello? I get so tired of seeing slouchy men. I, I, believe, I believe, listen, I, and I'm not, I, you don't have to put a suit on every day, but I, I believe you ought to look your best every day. 
I, 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 I've never seen a time when, when men and women today uh, want to look as slouchy as, as they can look. I, I'm so tired uh, of seeing these young guys running around with their britches down across their cheeks. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm just tired. We ought to make the best of how God has made us. But listen, listen. It's a fact that physical beauty was and is created by God. But I want to tell you, that's a very fragile foundation for marriage. You're going to find difficulty. Listen, if physical beauty was the key to a lasting and a happy marriage, then, then the starlets in Hollywood would have the longest lasting marriages on earth. But that's not so. As a young man, as a young woman... You need to make sure that you're marrying for something that, that's far deeper than the attractiveness of your prospective spouse, whether it's a male or a female. Proverbs 21 verse 30 said, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Then but one thing that makes a, a woman beautiful, and, and that's her love for God, her walk with God. Then but one thing that makes a man handsome, and that's his love for God and his walk with God. Well, uh, what were the days of Noah like? Days filled with wickedness. They were days characterized by wicked marriages. Secondly, there were days characterized by wicked men. Look at verse number four. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now then, I don't know whether you're writing your Bible or not, but you ought to learn to do that. It'll save you an awful lot of time going back and getting, getting you a, a, a strong concordance or a th 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 thesaurus or something, looking up words. Draw a circle around that word giant in verse number four. That word giant in that verse means a bully or a tyrant. I know the word giant and the man that David slew with his slingshot, that fellow Goliath who was like nine feet tall, has, has given a lot of fuel to those who hold to their, uh, these giants being the product of the marriage of wicked angels and fair women, beautiful women of that day. But, but the, word, the word giant has the sense of meaning of, of a tyrant, of a bully, of, of an attacker, of a bandit, of a terrorist. Some, someone who, 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 is, uh, uh, who has a, a name of being all those things. The term mighty means powerful. Powerful as, as a warrior. It may well be in, in light of the reference in verse 2 to the sons of God here that this could be a, a reference to the devil being the source of their might and their strength. Would you agree with me this morning that through the centuries, Satan has given great strength and power to those who hate and deny God? Would you agree with that? I mean, look at our world. Look at history. Look at the Hitlers and the Stalins. Look at the Castros and the Osama bin Ladens. And, 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 and look at the... And listen, I won't start calling names here in America, but all you've got to do is look at, look, at, uh, look at Washington and see the power that some of those people hold today. And it's not human-given power. It has to come from somewhere, and it's wicked, and so that means it has to come from the devil. Undoubtedly, these men... Wicked men played a prominent role in the wickedness of those days. Look over at verse 11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The word renown... Back, back here in, uh, in uh, verse number 4. The word renown in this verse simply means that these, these men were men of notoriety. That they were men uh, who uh, were esteemed highly. Well, godly men have never been esteemed highly. Down through the centuries, wicked men uh, have been men of renown. They, they've had a name. And so it is today. Uh, not only was Noah, Noah's day a day of wicked marriages and wicked men, but it's a, way, a day of wicked minds. Look at verse number five. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Not only were their actions wicked, but their imaginations were evil as well. Wickedness was great. Evil was rampant. It was widespread. Notice the, the last phrase of this fifth verse. Only evil continually. I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. There wasn't a time on the clock when evil was not prevailing. When Adam sinned and plunged the human race into sin, the heart of man became desperately wicked. The heart is the thought workshop. The, 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 inner, the inner being of man, the heart of man is the thought workshop. And long before sin becomes an outward action, it has formed itself in the imagination of the heart of man. It's a staggering thing just how much wickedness the depraved mind of man is capable of inventing. Listen, I, I, here I am at this stage in my life and I, I hear uh, I, and I read things about the wickedness of our day and I think how in the world could we ever, uh, could we ever sink so low in our culture to come to that place? Amen. I was sitting reading yesterday afternoon and there was a, a story on, one of the Fox, on the Fox app about a fireman who'd been called to an apartment because of a, of a, of a problem and, and, and they had to break in to get in. There wasn't anybody there. And they kept hearing a, a, a muffled sound uh, off of the kitchen area where the, they had a, were looking at a problem. And when they got in there, they found a little six-year-old girl under a blanket her, her hands were duct taped together. Her legs, her feet were duct taped together. Uh, she was literally emaciated. Uh, they said she had the weight of a one-year-old. She could, when they pulled the tape off her face, she couldn't even talk. She, she had never. She listen. You, I, I can't imagine what that poor little girl had gone. And I think, dear God. How could we ever come to that kind of a place in a culture and a society? But right here it is. In the imaginations of the hearts of men. Only evil continually. Where did Jesus say that those things came from? Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of man... Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All, he said, these things come from within and defile the man. Understand something, beloved. Your thought life is a garden for the devil to work in. A place for him to plant evil thoughts and evil plans for your life. Out of, your, out of your thought life flows the stream of your conduct. Your, your wickedness, the wickedness that you commit, the, 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 the flow of that wickedness comes from your thought life. So when we look at Noah's day and we look at the wickedness, we see that it was a, a day of wicked marriages, of wicked men, of wicked of wicked minds. But then I want you to notice something else. I want you to notice the witness. That's a horrible part of this thing. That, that, that's the bad part of this message from Genesis chapter 6. Now let's look at the good part, okay? Let, let's look at the witness of Noah's day. Uh, the world, and, and God has never left a day without His witness. There's never been a day that God did not leave a witness in this world. And there'll be a witness when the church is gone. Uh, somebody said, there won't be no witness in the world when the church is gone. Oh yeah, you hadn't read all Revelation and studied it like you should have, because there will be. The world of Noah's day was not without God's witness. God provided the wickedness of that day with light, truth, from at least three sources. 
First of all, there's the witness of the spirits pleading. Look at verse number three. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. This verse reveals that God was faithfully active during this time in the person of the Holy Spirit. Notice that word strive in verse number three. That word strive means to contend or, or to plead with. God graciously contended. God graciously pleaded with, with man in his wickedness to repent of his sin. Uh, what, a, what a revelation of the graciousness of God. God striving with man to repent. But it also reveals that his long-suffering and his patience have a limit. Don't, don't stop there with just thinking about how gracious God was to give them a witness, but read on because there's a warning there. There's a line, if you will, drawn in the sand uh, over which God will not go. God will not... Con Listen, that's the reason it's so dangerous for a person to sit in a church like this on a Sunday morning and the Spirit of God deal with their heart and them to say, no, I'll do it some other time. You don't know that you'll ever have another time. You don't know that the Spirit of God will ever contend with your heart again. What a warning here that the convicting, drawing minister of the Spirit should not be taken for granted in our lives. In this verse, we see that God's long-suffering was going to be limited to a number of years. 120 years, he said. Now, that's evidently the, uh, a reference to the time that it would take Noah to build the ark. When the ark was completed, God's judgment would come in the flood. There would be no more contending. There would be no more pleading of the Spirit. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, again talking about this period of time, the Bible says, which were sometime disobedient, talking about uh, the, the wicked people of that day, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the day of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Sadly, this morning, just as there was in Noah's day, there are those who misinterpret God's long-suffering and God's graciousness to them and they rebel against it. They resist that long suffering. They resist that pleading, that continuing, uh, that that contending with them, and they fail to repent. Read the read the read the chapter. For 120 years, God graciously, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, pleaded with men to turn from their sin and to turn to the living God. Not only do we see the witness of the Holy Spirit's pleading, but we also see the witness of Peter's preaching. Over in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says, talking again about this time, and spared, talking about God now, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, in an unrighteous world. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when Noah began preaching. We don't know when he started preaching. I don't know if he started preaching before God gave him the revelation about his judgment. I don't know when he started preaching. But it's very likely that it was around the same time that he started building the ark as God broke his heart and he realized that judgment was coming. From a human standpoint, Noah's preaching seemed to be a failure. I wonder how many mission boards, Brother Tom, would have kept Noah on for 120 years and he only had eight people saved. It's sort of like churches today. The preacher preaches his heart out and it's like a dry corn crib. Nothing rustling in the shucks but the rats running for their lives. Nobody getting saved. And people say, well, we've got to get us another preacher. Nobody's getting saved. But I want to tell you, that's not the answer to the problem. 
The, the answer to the problem is you and I getting holy right with God. But, but hear me. You need to understand something. In this day, nobody responded to Noah's message. Now, I, I, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist. I try to be optimistic about things. But as I look at the hour we're living in, and I'm not drawing the curtain for God. God will draw the curtain on this thing. God, God will say when it's over. I don't know when it's going to be over, but I'm telling you this. If I understand my Bible correctly, in the last days, those days are going to be cold days spiritually. They're, they're going to be day, difficult days. Days of hardness in the lives of people. That's how it was in Noah's day. He preached for over a hundred years. And really from, from the world's perspective... There was no visible results. But there were results. And Noah was victorious. You say, how, how could you say that? Because he was faithful. Faithfulness is victory in our lives as God's people. He preached righteousness in spite of the hardness of the hearts of men around him. But if you really want to look at the fruit of Noah's preaching... You don't have to look any further than who got on the ark when it said time, it's time to go in. His family. Let me tell you. You may not reach everybody that lives on Wilson Road and see them saved. You may not reach everybody that lives on Glentana Street and see them saved. You may not reach everybody that lives on Maple Street and see them saved. But it ought to be the goal of your life. It ought to be the goal of my life as a child of God to make sure that every member of your family has had an opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. I had an opportunity to trust Him as their Savior. Hebrews 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah being warned of God of things not yet seen as yet move with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of what? Of His house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And then 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 tells us only eight souls were saved. The witness in Noah's day involved the pleading of the Holy Spirit. It involved the preaching of Noah. But then that witnessing also involved the living of Noah. Look at verse number 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Here is a man who walked with God in the midst of a wicked, immoral, violent, depraved world. What a testimony this man Noah had. By God's grace, he did allow the exceeding wickedness of his day to enter into his heart and into his home. He kept it out. Noah didn't have time for all that stuff. He didn't have time to watch Netflix. He didn't have time to, to go to the motion picture uh, show and, and see some garbage. He didn't have time for social media. God had given him a project, and that project was to build an ark for the saving of his family. And he committed his life to that, and he walked with God in the midst of that. And it was a testimony to the whole world around him of his relationship with God. Not only did Noah walk with God, but he worked for God. Can you imagine what a testimony the building of this ark was in Noah's day? Somebody said it's the only boat that ever been built. No, I don't think it was the only boat that ever been built. You see, they had ponds in those days. They, they had water in those days. God created those when he created the earth along with the fish. They had to have boats to get out and fish and get fish. Huh? Yeah, they had boats in those days, but they didn't have no boat like the ark. Nothing had ever been built the size of the ark. Can you imagine what the people said as they looked at that? Every day as they passed by, Noah's out there with his hammer and with his saw. The, the boys are cutting logs and they're, 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 they're cutting those logs into planks so they can continue building the ark. Time's running out. They're, they're working, building. Every tree that's cut, every rasp of Noah's saw, every blow of his hammer uh, was a witness in the, in the world that the judgment of God was coming. So we see the wickedness of Noah's day. We see the witness of Noah's day. But then lastly, we see the will of God for Noah's day. Verses 6, 7, and 8. These verses reveal to us God's divine response to the wickedness of mankind. 
And I see two things that God had determined here. First of all, he determined the destruction of mankind. Look at verses 6 and 7. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. We see God's reaction here to the sinfulness of man. The word repented there is a word that some folks stumble over. That, that doesn't mean that God had decided that he would made a mistake. God never made a mistake. That's not what the word repented there means. God's character never changes. But his dealings with mankind changed based on depending on whether man is obedient or disobedient in his life. Let me give you an example. 1 Samuel chapter 15. The Bible says that God repented of making Saul king. That doesn't, that's not saying that God made a mistake when he made Saul king. When God made Saul king, Saul was living in obedience to the Lord. But when, when Saul turned away from God and obeying God, God was sorry. God repented that he had, had made Saul king. God's standards never change. He merely reacts to man in different ways depending on, on whether a man obeys or disobeys him. God's attitude toward man is conditioned by man's attitude toward God. The word grieved, look at it. The word grieved has the idea of, of hurting, uh, of having pain. Did, did you know in order to grieve, you have to be able to love. Amen. For you to be grieved by someone's attitude uh, would, would have to mean that, that you cared for that person. And, and for God, God's heart to be grieved here literally is giving us a picture of the fact that God loved them. God's heart was moved with grief over the sinfulness of man. Man that he loved, man that he'd created. Why was he grieved? Because evil filled the thoughts of man's heart. And because of that, God was grieved at his heart. Notice secondly here the, the ruling of God concerning the sinfulness of man. Verse number 7, God said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. That word destroy means to erase means to wipe out. It means to blot out. God is saying, I'm going to wipe out mankind. Not only did God's judgment fall upon man, but his judgment also fell on the animal kingdom. He lists them there. The beast, the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. Did, did you notice that there's no mention of, of sea creatures here? No mention of fish, fowl at all? Why? Because the earth's going to be covered by water and some of them are going to survive the flood. Uh, again, I remind you of the reason for God's judgment. He said, for it repenteth me that I have made them. When God looked at the wickedness of man and how great it was in the earth and how the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and because they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't heed the witness given to them. God sent judgment. God determined the destruction of mankind. God would send a flood to cover the entirety of the earth. So we see God's will was the destruction of mankind. And then lastly, we see the will of God was the deliverance of Noah. Look at verse number 8. What a wonderful verse. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I see a couple of things in that verse. First of all, I see the basis of Noah's salvation. By the way, right out beside it, same basis as your salvation. Grace. Whenever you hear some illiterate, dumb preacher say that people in the Old Testament were not saved like people in the New Testament are saved, you mark them up as ignorant, because they don't know what they're talking about. Man has never been saved any other way except through the grace of God. And by the way, 
That's the first mention of grace in the Bible. So you'd be well to pay attention to it. Here you've got grace against the backdrop of uh, man's sinfulness, against the gathering storm clouds of God's wrath. Here is the grace of God shining through like a, like a, like a beautiful ray of light breaking the, the, the horrible, frightening darkness of night. Though the devil had managed to corrupt the entire world, though, though Satan had, had so permeated the minds of man that, that his thoughts were con, uh, continually evil, uh, the, 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 though Satan, it seemed, was having a heyday, what you've got here, is God protecting His servant with a shield of His grace. I want you to notice here, Noah didn't earn grace in the eyes of the Lord. Is that, is that what that verse says? It doesn't say, but Noah earned grace in the eyes of the Lord. It didn't say God, Noah got grace because he gave to the church. It doesn't say Noah got grace because he took the Lord's Supper. It doesn't say Noah got grace because he was baptized. No, the Bible says, but Noah what? Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he was a just man. That means he was justified. He was a perfect man. He was complete. He was mature. He was godly in his generations. And he walked with God. Listen, God's method of salvation has been the, the, the very same method from the time Adam and Eve were booted out of the garden right up to this Sunday morning uh, in, in January of 2024. It's by grace alone through faith alone to the glory of God alone. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see the basis of his salvation. But then notice the means of his salvation. How did the Lord save Noah? Through the ark. That was the only way. That was the only way of salvation. There was no other way of salvation. If you didn't get on the ark, you died. That was it. If you didn't do what God said to do and get on the ark, you died. That was it. There's only one way of salvation from God's judgment. In fact, not only one way of salvation, but there was only one door to enter in. You get a picture? Do you see what the ark pictures? Do you see what it typifies? The Lord Jesus Christ. I don't get saved by being a Baptist. I don't get saved by being a Methodist. I don't get saved by being a Catholic. I don't get saved by being a Pentecostal. I'm saved because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Let me ask you this morning. Have you entered the ark of God's grace? Have you? Well, well, let me ask you. What's the state of your thought life? What, what's been going on in your mind since you've been sitting here uh, in, in the house of God today? What went on in your mind before you got here? What's going to go on in your mind after you leave here this morning? What is your, what is your life like in those secret chambers of your heart where imaginations take place? Where no one but God sees? What, what, is, your, what is your life like in, in those places? Have you entered the ark? Have you received God's free gift of grace like Noah did. Noah could have rejected the message of the Lord and he would have died just like all of his neighbors died. Just like everybody outside of his family died. He would have died just like them had he rejected the message of the Lord. Just like you're going to die and perish and in an eternal hell unless you accept the message of God's Grace, His love, His compassion, His Son who died on the cross for your sins. Will you trust Him as your Savior this morning? Bow your heads with me, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Miss Janet's coming. The piano. In just a moment, she'll begin to play an invitation song. And God help you this morning. Whether you're 10 years old or 16 years old or 
20 years old or 40 years old I don't, or, or, or 90 years old, hear me this morning. If you're not in the ark of safety, the Lord Jesus Christ, as sure as I'm breathing the air that God's allowed me to have in my lungs right now, Jesus is coming and you're going to be left behind to a terrible, terrible fate. Father, bless this invitation time now and help that one who has need in their heart to come this morning. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Our heads bowed and our eyes closed quietly for just a moment. God's speaking to your heart. You've got a need to come this morning. Don't, don't put that need off. You obey the Lord, would you?